Speaker Paul Fader is an activist based on the Lower Mainland and an outreach organizer for multiple volunteer organizations. He's a recent graduate from the study of animal ethics and philosophy and aspires to a career in animal law. We need more of those. The presentation is entitled The Argument for Animal Rights. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. So what I want to do now is delve deeper into the concept of disconnection from the perspective of animal ethics and philosophy. I'm going to try to articulate the argument for animal rights, all while sharing a little bit about my story and the revolutionary philosophical ideas that inspired me to become vegan. Four years ago, I wasn't an activist nor a vegan when I happened, a book called, happened upon a book called Animal Liberation by Peter Singer, which sent me on a path to answer one simple question. Look at the next slide. Is it morally permissible to exploit non-human animals? After all, everybody's doing it. It's what I was raised to do. Yet we kill some 80 billion land animals for food every year. We separate them from their families, cut off their tails and beaks, and inevitably kill them at a fraction of their lifespan. So there must be some impervious moral justification out there, I thought. For the sake of this presentation, the word exploit is synonymous with use. Exploitation refers to humans' use of animals for food, clothing, scientific research, entertainment, or any other activity where humans objectify animals for their own ends. None of the industries I mentioned are needed for humans to survive and thrive, so we cannot appeal to necessity to justify our exploitation of non-human animals. If not out of necessity, what could possibly entitle us to exploit them? The next slide. A typical place for philosophers to start is by comparing non-human animals to humans. Is it morally permissible to exploit humans the way we exploit non-human animals? Again, I'm not talking about a situation where one must kill to survive. I mean, is it morally permissible for me to capture some group of people in the audience right now, force them to breed with one another, and then pick people off in that group to be killed and eaten every day? Is that morally permissible? Well, I think the answer is pretty straightforward. No. Obviously, it is not morally permissible to exploit humans the way we exploit non-human animals. Next slide. So now we've got a philosophical problem. If exploiting non-human animals is morally permissible, while exploiting humans is wrong, there must be some difference between non-human animals and humans that explains why it's permissible to exploit non-human animals, but not humans. Here and we arrive at the key question at the center of any debate about animal rights. Next slide. What is the difference between human and non-human animals such that it is morally permissible to exploit non-human animals but not humans? Next slide. Here's an idea. It's an animal. I'm a human. We are simply different species, they say. Maybe that's what makes it OK. Well, we know we're different species, I'd say. This answer is almost like saying the difference between an apple and an orange is that one's an apple and the other's an orange. What I wanted to know is why this difference in species justifies the different ways in which we treat these species. Maybe what they're trying to say is that the morally relevant difference between non-human animals and humans is a difference in genes. It's the type of DNA the animals have that's different from humans. OK, but consider this. In the Twilight Zone episode, To Serve Man, an alien species called catamits invade planet Earth and enslave humans for food. How is this situation any different from our current relationship with non-human animals? Let's say we objected to what the catamites were doing to us. Let's say we asked, what right do you have to do this to me? And the catamites said, don't you get it? You're a different species than me. We have different DNA. We might say something like, OK, fine, we have different DNA, but it's still wrong to exploit me in this way. However, isn't that exactly what non-human animals would say to us if they could? Next slide. Many people are attracted to this kind of argument, that it's a difference in species that justifies our difference in treatment towards non-human animals. They might claim that a necessary condition for being someone with moral status, someone who matters morally in their own right, or someone with legal personhood who can hold legal rights, is that they must be a human. The problem with this view, which I first discovered through the work of Peter Singer, 
is that to reject the notion that a species has rights or moral status based solely on the fact that they are not a member of our species is equivalent to rejecting someone's rights or moral status on the basis of their race. Just like race or gender, species is just the group that you happened to be born into. After all, what if you were to encounter a being who was like you in every possible respect, except for the fact that they were human? Maybe they were an alien or a robot, but truly and exactly like you apart from being human. How could you be justified in giving them any less moral regard on the mere fact that they were not a member of the human species? This shows that like gender or race, species by itself is a morally irrelevant trait for determining who ought to be a patient of moral consideration. Excellent. Speciesism, then, is an attitude or prejudice of bias in favor of the interests of the members of one's own species and against those of the members of other species. Just like racism is a bias in favor of the interests of one's race, or sexism is a bias in favor of the interests of one's gender. Species, then, is not going to explain why it's OK to exploit non-human animals, uh, why it's OK to exploit non-human animals, but not OK to exploit humans. Let's try a different idea. When someone says, I'm a human, and it's an animal, maybe what they're trying to say is that humans are special. It's not a difference in species that matters so much as the advanced abilities our species possesses. This argument might sound something like, look at the incredible things that humans can do. We are rational beings who can form abstract ideas, do algebra, or contemplate philosophy. Whatever the suggestion might be, this view is trying to point to an intellectual capacity that only humans have, and then attempts to use that intelligence to explain why it's OK to exploit non-human animals, uh, but not OK to exploit humans. Next slide. The problem, however, is that whenever we make intelligence a necessary condition for moral status or legal personhood, the implication is that we have members of the human species who would not qualify. Anencephalic children, children born with very little brain structure above the brain stem, are often given as an example of this. They are members of the human species, but they will always lack the intellectual capacities we're considering. Despite this, we still think anencephalic children have rights and deserve moral consideration. This idea is referred to as the argument for marginal cases. It says that if animals do not have moral status due to a lack of intellectual capacities, then neither do human beings, such as infants, the senile, the severely cognitively disabled, or other such marginal cases of humanity who lack those same capacities. Next slide. So coming back to the question at hand, I started off by trying to explain why it's OK to exploit non-human animals, but OK to exploit uh, non-human animals, but not OK to exploit humans. First, I tried species, and that didn't work. Then I tried intelligence, and that didn't work either. What else? Well, let's quickly address two more commonly cited differences. Someone might tell you, well, I don't care about pigs, but I do care about people. The problem with this view is that the possession of your rights or moral status does not depend on the emotions that others may or may not have for you. I absolutely love the way Tyler Doggett put it. He said, if, for example, the reason it's wrong to exploit my baby cousin is because I care about him, then what you're saying is that the reason exploiting him is wrong doesn't have to do with my baby cousin so much as it has to do with me. But that doesn't seem correct. Exploiting my baby cousin is wrong because of what it does to him, not because of what it does to me. And exploiting him is wrong regardless of how I feel about him. Last difference. Some might claim that non-human animals are weak, that it's okay to exploit non-human animals because we can, because we're stronger, or because we are the top of the food chain. The reply here is that even though we might be in a position where we can do various things to the vulnerable, that does not entail that we should do those things. I run into big angry guys while doing my activism all the time. They could beat the pulp out of me if they tried. But imagine if one day they did and I said, you shouldn't have done that, that was wrong. And they said, look kid, I'm stronger than you. That's obviously terrible reasoning. With great power comes great responsibility. A good person uses their strength to protect the innocent. A bully does the opposite. Apart from strength or intelligence, if you could provide some reason to think that humans are morally superior to other animals, on top of that, you would then have to justify why this supposed superiority justifies exploiting non-human animals. What do I mean by this? Well, one philosopher that gave me pause during my studies was Shelley Kagan. In his book, How to Count Animals, he defends a species hierarchy, 
where some species are more morally important than others. He argued that, humans, that a human's interest in keeping their life is stronger than a cow's interest in keeping their life, since by losing their life, the human would be deprived of more goods than the cow. If we had to choose between a cow and a human, we would be perfectly justified in choosing the human, since typically the human would be missing out on all the goods a human could experience, like fulfilling life projects or life-changing adventures. So animals count, he says, but not as much as humans. However, even Dr. Kagan conceded that our supposed superiority fails to explain why it's OK to exploit non-human animals in the ways that we do. Next slide. He writes, no one reading this book is required to eat animals in order to stay alive. So in doing the relevant calculations regarding our own eating of animals, the relevant good to be compared to the threshold for violating animals' rights isn't the saving of lives, but only the slight marginal increase in pleasure that we may get from eating animal flesh rather than some vegan alternative. Obviously enough, this will make meat eating tremendously more difficult to justify, typically perhaps impossible. So let's say there was some kind of hierarchy where some species like humans are more morally important than others. Does this automatically permit us in exploiting, oppressing, or unnecessarily harming lower level species? Let's say there was an intellectual capacity that made a morally relevant difference. Am I allowed to exploit other humans who lack or have less of this capacity? Is an artificial or alien being that has more of this capacity justified in exploiting me? Remember, I did not set out to find some reason why humans are usually better than other animals or why we might prioritize humans in a life or death situation. I sought to find the difference between humans and non-human animals that explains why it's okay to exploit non-human animals but not humans. And I found no serious philosopher or ethicist who even dared to defend the common and frivolous ways in which we use animals. Apart from preventing greater harm or trying to survive, there seem to be very few reasons that justify causing harm to anyone who can be harmed, regardless of their position on a hierarchy. In the end, I found that we are appallingly unable to justify withholding from all sentient beings the same basic rights that we accord to all humans. No matter their race, religion, gender, or intellectual capability, all humans have inherent moral value. They do not all have or require the right to vote or run for office, since those rights are not relevant to all humans. But they all have rights to be free from cruelty and exploitation, since they can be exploited or treated cruelly. If this is true, then sentient non-human animals must also possess those same basic rights, since there is no morally relevant difference about them that explains why we should not extend those same basic rights to them. A frequently asked question about this conclusion is, what or who counts? What about other organisms like plants? Well, unlike the separation of the human species from all other animals, there is a significant morally relevant difference between almost all animals and other living organisms, which I've been hinting throughout this presentation. And it's sentience. Sentience is the ability to experience feelings and sensations. Being sentient means that one has a subjective awareness of oneself and the environment that surrounds them. A sentient being has the potential to feel pain, pleasure, fear, or joy, just like all the animals that we routinely exploit. The reason we should think that sentience is a necessary and sufficient condition for having moral status and rights is that if one is sentient, they have conscious wants and desires. Their interests, what is good or bad for them, actually matter to them. If I kick a rock or a plant down the street, the rock does not and cannot care. But if I kick a cat down the street, this will be consciously bad from the perspective of the cat. Maybe the rock has sentimental value to somebody else, or the plant has aesthetic beauty to somebody else, in which case they are instrumentally valuable. But unlike the rock or the plant, the sentient being is also intrinsically valuable. They have value for their own sake. What happens to them actually matters to them, regardless of how anyone else may value them. Sentience, then, is the morally relevant trait that makes sense of the moral significance possessed by all humans and non-human animals. When faced with the question of how to regard or treat our fellow animals, the question is not, can they reason, nor can they talk, famously said by Jeremy Bentham, but can they suffer? Why should the law refuse its protection to any sensitive being? In the eyes that you see before you, there is a someone, not a something, looking back at you. We have every reason to believe that their interest in living or being free from harm is as important to them as it is to any of us. 
And so they have intrinsic moral value and therefore deserve legally protected rights that are relevant to them, like the right to live free from torture, the right to live free from slavery or to be someone's property, the right to live free from discrimination. All of these are typically thought of as human rights. Although, they are, although these are typically thought of human rights, they are also relevant to sentient non-human animals since they are similarly harmed by a lack of these rights. Depriving them of such protections under the law without a morally relevant difference to do so is purely illogical and a shining example of speciesism. Next slide. In my view, the disconnection that Frank points out is our current anthropocentric hegemony over other animals. We attempt to justify the exploitation of other animals in the same ways that we've attempted to justify the discrimination of other vulnerable groups by focusing on arbitrary, morally irrelevant traits like gender, race, might, intelligence, or species. Making the connection means recognizing our place among all other sentient beings, in which we all possess rights that are relevant to us, like the right to life, liberty, and personal security. If you look back at human history, how frivolously we excluded other marginalized groups, refusing even to call some races human, I think a little humility and openness to this idea is required of us. And as I've learned through my activism, I think we already intuitively understand the rights of other beings. We intuit injustice when we see how our fellow animals are treated. So by acknowledging their moral worth and protecting them from exploitation, we aren't changing ourselves so much as we are becoming more of who we already are. Thank you. Thank you.